ओके सो आचार्य चंद्र कीर्ति हु इज द फाउंडर ऑफ द प्रसंगिक स्कूल हिस्स टेक्स्ट हैज द टेन ग्राउंड मध्यमिका अवतारा टेक्स्ट ऑल द टेन ग्राउंड आर all the 10 grounds are explained one by one so the first ground uh, so the first ground starts or the first perfection it starts at the path of seeing and between path of seeing and path of meditation which is the third and the fourth path all these 10 grounds are achieved okay mem path of accumulation yes first one path of accumulation okay. path of preparation then seeing then meditation then no more learn yes okay so the first path is the first gate of the hat sutra mantra second gate is the path of preparation uh third uh, paragate paragate is the path of seeing the third parasamgate is the path of meditation and bodhisaha is the path of no more learning okay Okay now if you have no other questions ma'am is there uh, the recording of that class of uh, kayas you sent uh yes all the recordings are there okay thank you yeah. okay so to be precise i'll tell you which day the five kayas right i think it's the class i took on 7th of october so okay. the five kayas uh, this video i was i think i went live yes 7th october video i went live it must be on facebook uh cibs okay. page you will find it there the video on 7th of october okay. so that was on the five kayas okay all right so any other questions before we go on to the madhyamika school okay no questions all right so i had briefly explained madhyamika philosophy uh, giving examples of uh, if you remember the rainbow and the mirage and the movie projector right so that was just an overview like just a uh, general understanding of madhyamika philosophy okay so i think i asked you to i did okay so i did give the definition of madhyamika school so there's a definition of madhyamika school as one just a madhyamika school and then you, within madhyamika there's swatantrika madhyamika and prasangika madhyamika so each swatantrika madhyamika and prasangika they have their own definitions so the overall overarching definition of madhyamika school is if you have it jotted down a buddhist tenet holder okay so whenever you you hear the term buddhist tenet holder automatically you have to understand that anybody who upholds the four seals they are the buddhist tenet holder so this is this we must keep in mind 
So when you hear the term Buddhist tenant holder, it automatically means a person who upholds the four seals of the Buddha. Okay. Uh, I'm just hoping everyone remembers the four seals. Right? Okay. Yeah. Is there anyone who'd like to share the four seals? Yes. Anybody would like to share the four C's? Okay. Uh, Padmala, would you like to try? Padmala, Padmala Nrula, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, would you like to try what are the four seals? Mm, I can't, I can't be able to take in them. Okay, no problem. Rigzana Mula, would you like to try? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, all composite things are impermanent. All mm -hmm. contaminated things are of suffering nature. Mm -hmm. Everything is of the nature of emptiness and selflessness. Mm -hmm. The transcend transcending sorrow is absolute peace. Perfect. Very nice. Okay. Uh, Rigzini Andula, would you like to try? Mm, uh, I only remember three of them. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Whatever you remember. Uh, all composite things are impermanent. Mm -hmm. All contaminated things are of uh, suffering nature. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is of the nature of emptiness and um, selflessness. Mm -hmm. And I didn't remember. The last is transcending sorrow is absolute peace. Mm -hmm. Okay. Transcending yeah. sorrow. Okay, so I'm going to repeat the four. Okay, Padma Landola, if you haven't no noted them down, uh, do so. These are very important, right? The four seals, because uh, when we are studying the tenet system, all the four schools, right? Vaibhashika, Swatantraka, Chittamatra, and Madhimika, all four schools are Buddhist tenet holders, right? So all these four schools are Buddhist tenet holders, which means all these four schools, they adhere to, the, to these four seals of the Buddha. Okay, so first is, Okay, in Tibetan, it's called Chagya Ji. Chagya means seal. Ji is four. Chagya Ji. Okay, so all composite things are impermanent, which I explained uh, many times. Composite as in any thing which is made of parts, which is compounded, they are impermanent. This is the first. All composite or compounded, sometimes you may find the term compounded. So all composite things are impermanent, first seal. All, second is, all contaminated things are of the nature of suffering, right? All contaminated things are of the nature of suffering. Uh, contaminated things means contaminated by what? Contaminated by the self-grasping ignorance. So as long as we have the self-grasping ignorance, anything that arises out of this is of the nature of suffering so basically all our emotions all our emotions even our emotions towards our parents which is okay conventionally it's considered a okay it's it's, it's a virtuous thing to have love for your parents but even that is contaminated by the self-grasping ignorance seeing the parents and you as independently existing out uh, there's a duality, your mind and the and your parents, right? So because of that ignorance, as long as this ignorance is there, anything that arises, any, mostly the emotions, feelings, these are all of the nature of suffering. So this is the second C, all contaminated things are of the nature of suffering. Okay. Third, everything is of the nature of emptiness and selflessness. 
So there's nothing which is, uh, which has selfhood, right? So, or there's nothing which is independently existent. So everything is self, everything has selflessness and emptiness. So that is the third C. Everything is of the uh, everything is of the nature of selflessness and emptiness. And the fourth is transcending sorrow is absolute peace, which means when all your sorrows become zero, your happiness becomes hundred, hundred percent. Right. So when you transcend sorrow, that is the state of absolute peace. That is the state of nirvana. Okay, so these are the four seals. So the definition of Madhyamika, a Buddhist tenet holder who expounds the absence of true existence, even on the level of a particle. Okay, I'll repeat. A Buddhist tenet holder, this is the definition of Madhyamika, right? A Buddhist tenet holder who expounds the absence of true existence even on the level of a particle okay so true existence independent existence ultimate existence these three are synonymous a buddhist standard holder who expounds the absence of true existence even on the level of a particle so when you this this term true existence is synonymous with independent existence and ultimate existence so they reject they reject true existence they reject independent existence they reject uh, ultimate existence okay so divisions of madhyamika there are two two schools right Madhyamika is divided into Sautantrika Madhyamika and Prasangika Madhyamika, which I had explained earlier. Okay, so the founder of Madhyamika school is Arya Nagarjuna. And the root text, the text which explains the Madhyamika philosophy is the Mula Madhyamika Karika text. Mula Madhyamika. Mool means the root um essence mulamadhyamika karika in english it's fundamental wisdom of the middle way by arya nagarjuna so what happened after arya nagarjuna wrote this text uh different scholars studied those texts this text and they came up with their own understanding right they, their own view so there were two different views that came and uh, that led to the two different types of Madhyamika school, Swatantraka Madhyamika and Prasangika Madhyamika. So Swatantraka Madhyamika also known as, known as the autonomous middle way school and Prasangika Madhyamika is known as the consequentialist middle way school. These are the English translations. Okay, so Acharya Bhava Viveka is believed to be the founder of the autonomous middle way school, which is Swatantraka school. Okay. And uh, Prasangika Madhyamika school, and there are, okay, so some people say Acharya Buddha Palita is the founder and some say Acharya Chandrakirti is the founder. So Acharya Buddha Palita and Acharya Chandrakirti, they both, okay, basically it said that Acharya Buddha Palita came up with a commentary. Uh, it's called Mula Madhyamika Vritti, commentary on Mula Madhyamika Karika. And then uh, Acharya Bhava Viveka, who is the opponent, who did not agree with Acharya Buddha Palita's text, he came up with his own commentary rejecting Acharya Buddha Palita's positions, right? And then it said that much later, later Acharya Chandrakirti wrote a text defending Acharya Buddha Palita. 
सो आचार्य चंद्रकीर्ति टेक्स इज इन डिफेंस ऑफ आचार्य बुद्ध पलित टेक्स बेसिकली रिजेक्टिंग आचार्य भव विवेक टेक्स स्टैंड पॉइंट राइट सो दैट्स हाउ टू ऑफ दम बिलीव टू बी द प्रोफाउंडर्स ऑफ प्रसंगिक स्कूल राइट ओके आचार्य चंद्रकीर्ति टेक्स इज मध्यमिक अवतारा entering into the middle way entering in the middle into the middle way okay so which has all the 10 grounds bodhisattva grounds explained very extensively okay so these are the divisions the two schools how is the name again of the text please which text of the chandrakirti chandrakirti okay acharya chandrakirti text is madhyamika avatara entering into the middle way okay which has the 10 bodhisattva grounds explained all right okay now uh now we go on to the swatantrika school swatantrika madhyamika school the uh, middle way autonomous autonomous middle way school so this school again we follow the same pattern we talk about the definition the etymology okay we did not go much into the etymology of the different schools and the divisions and the presentation of the tenet or exposition of the tenet system which has three parts assertion on the basis assertion on the path and assertion on the result so we're going to follow the same pattern for both the schools swatantrika madhyamika and prasangika madhyamika okay now going to the definition of swatantrika madhyamika school okay all right so you can jot it down a proponent of entity less who accepts self characteristics on the conventional level Okay, first I'll give you the definition, and then I'll explain. Right? Okay, Swatantrika definition of Swatantrika Madhyamika school: a proponent of entityless who accepts. who accepts self characteristic on the conventional level can you repeat it please because it was lost okay for me all right uh, a proponent of entity less who accepts self characteristics on the conventional level a proponent of entity less who accepts self characteristics on the conventional level okay i know the definition is very very technical but don't worry we'll i'll try to explain it with an example okay Okay so let's just keep the definition of swatantrika madhyamika for the time being now we'll go on to the divisions right okay let's skip the etymology okay we're going to the divisions now swatantrika madhyamika again has two divisions this i've never talked about before this is something completely new right so swatantrika madhyamika there are again two divisions of the school and it's not difficult okay so what is the second school anybody which is the second school of the tenet system but this tenet system swatantrika okay swatantrika is the second school which is the third school chittamatra chittamatra Chitta Matra or Yoga Chara School, right? Both are same. Okay. 
So what you can do is the first, the second school Swatantrika, you can add, you can put the word Swatantrika in front of the, of the school, Swatantrika Madhimika. Swatantrika, Swatantrika Madhimika. This is the first division. Swatantrika, Swatantrika Madhimika. The spelling is different. Swatantrika is S-A-U-N. T R I K A S A U N T R I K A Swatantrika Swatantrika S V A Swa S V A T A N T R I K A Swatantrika Swatantrika Madhyamika. That is the first division. And then what you can do is instead of uh, we can pick the word yoga chara instead of chitamatra. So you just put the term Yogacara in the front, Yogacara Swatantrika Madhyamika. These are two different kinds of Swatantrika Madhyamika schools. School, sorry. Okay, so, all right. So anybody who remembers, what is the difference, the stark difference between uh, Swatantrika school and Chitamatra school? There are many differences, but what is the stark difference in, okay, if you have the definitions with you, you'll see the def, you can read the definition and you can automatically pick up what is that thing they differ on. Okay, anybody? Ma'am, Swatantrika school is related to Theravada Buddhism and uh, uh, Jogachara or Chitsamatra school is related to Mahayana. Uh, um, no. Mm, okay, that is a difference, but more in terms of the motivation, right? There's a different Mahayana. Yeah. Why? Because their motivation is to benefit all sentient beings. So not in terms of motivation, in terms of the philosophy, in terms of the tenet system. Yes, uh, Dolkala. Uh, from Chitta Matra, they reject externality. Yes, very good. Yeah. And South Antarctica? Mm. Do they also they, reject? They accept self cognizant mind and externality. Who? Uh, Swatantrika. Okay. So, Swatantrika, the stark difference is Swatantrika, they accept externality, right? and Chittamatra, they reject externality. So that is the difference. So here, what you have to do is, the only thing is, you keep the Swatantrika Madhyamika philosophy as it is. You can just, this, uh, okay, so where the Swatantrika Madhyamika, where they accept externality, they become the Swatantrika, Swatantrika Madhyamika. And where the Swatantrika Madhyamika, they reject externality, they become the Yogacara Swatantrika Madhyamika. That's the difference. Okay, so I think when I say externality, by now everybody understands what it is, right? Okay. Okay, is there anyone who would like to tell me what do you understand by externality? Okay, when we say Chitamatra rejects externality, what do they mean? What do we mean? All right, is there anybody who would like to try? Yes, I'm sure like uh, Chitamatra, we've been giving a lot of examples. There are a few examples, the dream example and the mirror, the ocean. Okay, the ocean was to understand the Alia Vigyan, right? But more in terms of the mirror and the dream, if you can understand what is externality, how do they reject externality? Yes. Okay, just speak your mind. Objectivity or independent existence. They reject the independent existence. Of what? Independent of what? So when you of say they reject independent existence, uh, then you could 
it could also mean the mediumica uh, philosophy so you have to be very specific independent of what independent of the mind right the mind creating yeah. so there's a huge where there's a huge difference when you add independent of the independent of things existing by the power of the mind to yeah. mental imputation whereas if you just say it's uh, they are rejecting independent existence then it could mean madhyamika the prasangika view right so we have to be very specific yes so what happens is uh, okay so externality means in your dream in your dream you see the dream objects to be independent of your mind right so there according to chitamatra for them that is ignorance so they reject that externality they say it is nothing but coming from your mind everything is coming from your mind everything is like dream illusion right so that is externality okay so we have swatantrika swatantrika madhyamika the divisions of swatantrika madhyamika and the yogachara swatantrika madhyamika the two different schools the two different divisions okay okay the de definitions are there but uh, i think we can skip that part okay now let's do the presentation right okay so basically okay now we are going to do the exposition of swatantra kamadhimika all right okay so there are three parts assertion on the basis assertion on the path and assertion on the result all right so basically assertion on the basis uh, okay now swatantrika madhyamika school the second school is a very important school why because when they talk about the basis if you all remember the six points right the six points that we studied under swatantrika school all right okay is there anyone who remembers those six points yes so we are going to actually these six points how to understand phenomena how they how do they divide the phenomena the objects okay so object is basically what your mind interacts with so assertion on the basis has assertion on the object and subject so object subject object is what your what your mind interacts with subject is the mind that feels right that experiences so anything that your mind interacts with depending on the nature of that object our mind also gives reaction for example if somebody shows anger at you okay so there's somebody this person who's very angry right who's abusing you so based on that object anger our mind which is the subject experiences and uh, unpleasantness right and if instead of this person your mother comes your mother is very loving so based on this object which is the mother mother the nature of the mother like the object right which is very compassionate again your subject also experiences uh happiness so this subject object so we have to understand what are these objects that your subject interacts with and what are the subject so subject person consciousness and terms and labels right we did the three different top, uh, topics object okay object is all phenomena other than the mind that the mind interacts with so those objects okay whatever we studied in under assertion on the objects in swatantrika school we can apply to all schools right do you remember the six six points that we did yes anybody okay are you all with me or yeah ma'am we are <laughs> okay okay first is two truths uh huh Uh, specifically and generally characteristic phenomena mm -hmm. negative and positive phenomena yes 
manifest and hidden phenomena mm -hmm. three times mm -hmm. and oneness and differentness very nice okay so we have these six points the two truths generally and specifically characterized and negative and positive phenomena manifest and hidden phenomena three times oneness and differentness okay so i hope you all remember what are these six points right we did we did have an extensive discussion on these all right so you can we, we can take all these six points to even chitta matra to swatantrika madhyamika and prasangika madhyamika so we can apply all these objects assertion on the objects uh, these different kinds of phenomena to understand the phenomena we can take all these six points plus okay okay so anybody has any question on what are these six points or have you all understood okay so basically under oneness and differentness we did the entity and the isolate right and three times the past present and future how different schools understand the past present and future manifest and hidden phenomena okay that also we did quite quite a number of times right okay manifest phenomena are those which are which are more access which are directly accessible to the sens sensory consciousness where we do not have to use any logic or reasoning to get to the object and hidden phenomena is where we use some logic so within hidden we talked about the slightly hidden and very hidden phenomena right okay and specifically characterized and generally characterized phenomena is again we talked about let's say the term the general term flower when i talk about a flower so flower becomes a generally characterized phenomena whereas if okay so we are 12 of us here if each of us come with one different one kind of flower so there are different kinds of flower in the world right if you, if okay let's say if dokala comes with rose flower i come with orchid somebody comes with uh, sunflower different flowers they become the specific characterized specifically characterized phenomena right okay so and two truths ultimate truth and the conventional truth okay so those two truths they differ in all schools you cannot apply the swatantrika view in the madhyamika schools all right so once we know all the phenomena what our mind interacts with okay we must remember one thing very important thing okay so every phenomena has two truths this this you can jot down every phenomena has two truths okay so this is pen which is also a phenomenon and uh, this is a book which is also a phenomenon right so this pen has two truths this book has two truths me as a person i have two truths every phenomena has two truths this we must remember and what are the two truths the ultimate truth and the conventional truth right and depending on the different schools they have their own understanding of what is ultimate truth and the conventional truth this we need to keep in mind okay this is the common of every tenet system yes this is basically a reality which ex which is accepted by all four schools in fact even uh, other traditions they talk about two truths some of the other but i don't know how well defined they are all right okay now we now we go to the two truths now let me okay okay before that let me give you some terms right 
So when we gave the definition of the Madhyamika school, we did, what did we say? The Buddhist standard holder who expounds the absence of true existence, even on the level of a particle. So, okay. So you can just write, okay. You can just write true existence slash true existence slash independent existence. Okay, this is very important to understand the Madhyamika philosophy, the two different schools of Madhyamika. We can only understand if we understand these terms, right? True existence slash independent existence slash um, ultimate existence. These three are synonymous. So true existence slash independent existence slash ultimate existence. These three terms are synonymous. And both the schools, both the Madhyamika schools, Swatantraka Madhyamika and Prasangika Madhyamika, they reject these true existence. Both the schools reject. Independent existence, both the school they reject. And ultimate existence. They, all both the schools, Swatantraka and Prasang Swatantraka Madhyamika and Prasangika, they reject these three. These three, which mean the same, true existence slash independent existence slash ultimate existence. Okay, now the there are set of another four terms which are synonymous. Okay, you can write it down. Objective existence slash Objective existence slash independent, oh, sorry, intrinsic existence. Objective existence slash intrinsic existence slash inherent existence. Slash existence through self characteristics. existence through self characteristic so these four terms objective intrinsic inherent and self characteristic these are synonymous to each other and this is accepted by swatantraka madhyamika okay so basically what swatantraka how swatantraka and madhyamika uh, prasangika madhyamika how do they differ so Atantraka Madhimika, they say that there is 50% subject, things exist 50% subjectively, 50% objectively. This is what they say. So Atantraka Madhimika. Whereas Prasangika Madhimika, they say things exist 100% subjectively. There's nothing on the object, from the object side. Everything 100% subjectively. This is uh, the Prasangika view. Whereas Swatantraka Madhyamika, what they say is there's 50% from the subject, 50% from the object. That is how things exist. When you say 50% from the object, they talk about the self characteristic or there's some objectivity, right? Okay, so. All right, so there's a, okay, so there's a, there's one thing. Okay, how many of you have studied quantum physics? Yes. Okay, Beatrice has studied quantum physics. Uh, an idea, not, not so deeply, but I have an idea, not so uh -huh. deeply, but I, I, I know about it. Okay, let's let's let me ask. Uh, how many of us know quantum physics uh, the way? Okay, let's. Okay, the way an expert on quantum physics would know. At this moment, I think. Okay, so if there's anybody, if there's a physicist amongst us, okay, if there's no one, then. 
All right, so let's say, let's just imagine that there's a quantum physics professor who comes and gives you two or three lectures on quantum physics, right? Can we possibly understand quantum physics in two, three lectures? Yes, no, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, quantum physics is a very, it's a very subtle uh, knowledge, I think, at this moment. Of all the disciplines, quantum physics is very subtle. So I think, uh, okay, so this prasangika view or the madhyamika view is like quantum physics. So whatever we are, I'm trying to explain, okay, so just getting a gist of it is enough because to really understand, don't try, okay, so when I'm trying to explain, don't try to really grasp at the understanding of Prasangika view or Madhyamika view because the understanding is very subtle, which needs a lot of studies, a lot of reflection and also meditation, right? Only then one can possibly get a glimpse of say like whatever they're talking about, you, you may say that, oh, this is, this is it. This is how it is, I think, you know. Otherwise, just, uh, so while we are, we are, I'm trying to explain, this is just to get a very generic understanding. To really understand this philosophy, uh, even my teacher warned many times that it's almost like studying quantum physics. And in fact, uh, one of the, uh, Physicist, I think uh, Professor Raman uh, Ramanujan, who's I think who's a professor in the U.S. Indian origin, he once told His Holiness the Dalai Lama that I think I mentioned this before. Uh, quantum physics is a very new discipline which came up very recently. So what quantum physics has discovered now was already discovered. 2,500 years ago by Buddha, because he studied Nalanda philosophy, the Prasangika view, Madhyamika school. So he said, whatever is being said in Madhyamika school is being discovered by the scientists now after 2,500 years. So there's a very close link between the quantum physics understanding and the emptiness according to the Madhyamika philosophy. So this we must keep in mind. And this is said by a physicist, right? All right. So, okay. Quantum physics. Sorry? Quantum physics. Yes, quantum physics. So basically quantum physics, uh, even I haven't studied, but the, just a very uh, simple understanding that I got is, it's said by quantum physicists that when you, okay, when you, uh, when you eject a particle at the speed of light under certain circumstances, right, given in, given under certain circumstances, this particle, depending on the perceiver, the person who perceives it, uh, it either acts as a wave or matter. So there's no objectivity. That's what quantum physics is saying. It depends on the, uh, it entirely depends on the perceiver, whether this is a particle or a wave. It depends on the perceiver. So from the object side, one cannot say that this is a particle or one cannot say this is a wave, right? But only depending on the perceiver who's perceiving this, one can, that is the idea of quantum physics. Okay, for those of you who would like to go further, you can read about it in double slit experiment. There's, there's an experiment done, which is called the double slit experiment. Okay. Okay, now going back to the projector, the movie projector, watching a movie on the screen, right, in the movie theater. All right. So, 
Okay, so I had shared this earlier. What happens is, okay, you're watching a movie. So what happens is when you're watching a movie, you are completely, okay, what is, I was just thinking today, what is that one thing which is really, really, uh, okay, have you ever, I'm sure all of us have watched movies, right? Okay, have you, okay, how many of you have cried watching a movie? <laughs> okay, I, I'm including myself. Myself too. Okay, how many of, how many of you have cried or let's say, okay, one scenario is when you're completely taken up, taken by this movie and you cry because you feel whatever you're watching on the screen is so real, right? Okay. And the other thing is, okay, how many of you are into horror movies? Either you are, okay, so when you're watching a horror movie, you are, okay, you are just so Jurassic much, Park. Okay, Jurassic Park is more like a thriller. Horror means where you really see a ghost in the movie, <laughs> right? So what is happening is most of the time uh, when we watch a movie like, okay, a very emotional scene or where you are watching a horror movie where there's a ghost and you really feel that this ghost is there and you, okay, there are people who cannot watch a horror movie alone because why? Because you feel that the ghost is going to come and really you know do something to you if you're alone right so okay why i'm bringing this up is because okay so i i like hor watching horror movies so sometimes when you give it a thought sometimes when you give it a thought it's very funny how our mind works right so it's like falling asleep when you go off to sleep okay so one time uh one time my teacher in the class, he asked, he sort of shared his own experience. He said uh, he tried to, he tried to watch his mind while going off to sleep. So that is again, a it's a sort of a meditation. So he said he was in bed going off to sleep and he kept looking at his mind. He kept watching his mind, how his mind behaves when he's falling asleep. So I think all of us can try that and then he shared his experience and he said, maybe people may have different experiences, but okay, so I'll just share what he had shared. So what he said that, or what he said was, so initially he said his mind, it felt like a completely blank, uh, let's say blank screen, completely blank smooth screen, right? When you're, okay, so when you're watching that screen, you are still awake you're very much aware that you are looking at your mind, you're aware. And then what happens? Slowly he said, that plain white screen started to have this uh, matte look. We all know what is a matte look, right? So we have this very clean slate and then we have this matted, uh, matted screen, which is a little, uh, which is not so clean. It has some matte look. So that clean, very clean slate or the screen, it turns matted. And then he said, the next thing he experienced was, there were some protrusions, right? So, okay, so you start seeing some protrusions coming from that screen. And then he said, okay, slowly, okay, now, he, now the mind is going off, falling off to sleep. And now slowly those protrusions, they take the shape of the eyes, nose, you know, the face. And you're, and he said, I was still awake. I was aware that this is just my mind creating it, right? And then suddenly this face becomes a very well-defined person's face, right? And then he said, okay, he was still awake. He was still aware that he's, going off to sleep and this is just my mind mental creation 
and then he said suddenly this person really came to life <laughs> suddenly became so much alive and started shouting at him right there he said even then he was aware that this is my mind's creation this is not real and then once the person really started to shout at him and he was not reacting initially because he was trying to be aware this is this is just my mental creation and the moment he said that he reacted to this person's abuse or anger he shouted back the moment he shouted back he was caught by the dream he was caught sucked into the dream right so this is what happens so this is this is what my teacher said his experience was and uh, he said it may not be exactly the same but uh, uh more so similar should be similar in most of the cases right so this is what happens this is how our mind uh, sort of transforms while you're falling asleep and the moment your mind starts to react to the object of your dream that is when you're sucked into the dream you're sucked by the dream right and now you can apply the same uh thing when you're watching a movie so initially you come with your friends you sit together in a movie theater like okay so you're anticipating some kind of fun watching a movie so there you know that okay so there you know that this is just a movie right and then you are relaxed in the chair and then slowly you are being sucked by the movie and you feel like you're in the movie right and then there comes a very emotional scene where you're actually crying it's actually very funny because whatever is in the screen is just a movie we know how movies are made but yet we cry right so this is more like the ignorance this is more like being sucked by the dream even when you're watching a horror movie when you're extremely scared when you just feel like the ghost is behind you so these are all examples of how we are sucked by ignorance how our mind is completely engulfed by ignorance that we fail to see that what you see on the screen in front of you is nothing but just pixels in reality they are just pixels and behind those pixels are nothing but those actors who took months and years to actually create that movie into in different films right different slots different shots put together so in spite of knowing all these facts we are still sucked by the movie we are still uh, consumed by what's happening on the screen because we think it's so real right so this is the ignorance okay now what we see we see on the screen okay when you actually we think that everything is coming from the screen but the reality is it's coming from the projector right so projector is basically your mind and screen is the object right so when you actually go in search of what is there on the screen you will not find it but what you will find is it's coming from the projector do you all agree okay so prasangika view uh, sorry madhyamika school they do not reject uh they do not reject existence though they say there is no objectivity they they do accept existence okay for example sorry for example the pen right okay they say the pen does exist okay now you have to listen to me very carefully this is very important the madhyamika view they accept the existence of pen they say that pen does exist okay basically all schools they say the, the pen exist what is the mode of the existence of the pen there all the schools differ this not just buddhist four buddhist schools even other philosophies other different traditions philosophical traditions in the world the moment you ask them what is the mode of existence of the pen then they all differ in their views right so when you ask according to madhyamika school when you ask the question what is the mode of existence of this pen then they say this pen is dream like okay okay so dream like 
this pen is dream like this is this pen is not dream this is not a dream pen okay now can you all make a distinction between dream pen and dream like pen is there anyone who would like to tell me what is the difference between dream pen and dream like pen um i assume a dream pen is something um imaginary and dream like pen can be um something that uh, is real but is coming from the mind like your example but okay. it's not imaginary uh -huh. okay conventional is real <laughs> Okay. More or less. Okay. Thank you, Beatrice. Anyone else would like to tell me what is the difference between the dream pen and the dream-like pen? So we did the analogy of the rainbow, the mirage, right? You can apply those analogies to this pen, the question that I asked. So there's one thing called dream pen and there's another thing called dream-like pen. There's a huge difference between the two. Anybody else? Yes, please try to brainstorm and uh, just speak your mind. Just ask yourself and whatever you feel, you can share. Dream pen and dream like pen. Dream like pen and dream pen. What is the difference? Okay, first let me ask you, is there a difference? Is there dream a difference? Pen is, um, not reality, but dreamlike pen is um, reality. In reality, it is uh, existed. Okay. It exists in real. The dream pen doesn't exist in real. Yeah. Okay. Okay, anyone else? First, you need to agree. Mm, uh, yes. What? Yes. Uh, dream Allah. pen. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, uh, dream uh -huh. pen can be uh, imaginary, uh, just uh, as uh, Beatrice said. And dream like pen could be like, uh, it seems like it exists, but when we try to reach to it, it does not exist. Very nice. Okay. Ma'am, uh, can it be something related to what you had explained once earlier with the blue pen? I remember that the absence of the blue pen really doesn't mean that uh, it's uh, the absence goes away. So when uh, even an uh, actual blue pen comes, uh, it, 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 it's two separate things actually. The absence still remains, even though there is a substance, uh, a, a real substance in the form of a blue pen which is in its place. So is this something to do with something in a similar manner, if we can understand a dream pen and a dream-like pen, something uh, very close to that, that they are in both two categories. Okay, so Dr. Lopamudraji, you're saying the dream pen is more like, which doesn't have a substance. Yeah. And the dream-like pen is something which has a substance. Uh, yeah, some and and they are uh, they can't be uh, occupying each other's space. So they both have their own individual entity and uh, individual spaces. Uh, um, that's what I want to say, basically. Okay, in more in terms of space. Yeah, yeah, space. yeah, yeah, yeah. They both exist in their own uh, areas, uh, uh, so to say. Mm -hmm. Okay, dream pen and dream like pen. Okay. Okay. Okay, in terms of space, occupying space. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, Tsarin so, uh, Rokala, you were saying something? Ma'am, I, I was saying that uh, uh, substantial, uh, dream like pain is like substantial, and uh, dream pain is uh, subjectively. Uh, Conceptual or what? Conceptual. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So dream like pen is conceptual coming from the mind 
and green light pen has substance. Right? Okay, very nice. Okay, anyone else would like to try? What about the others? Rajdeep, would you like to try? Yes, ma'am. Yes. <clears throat> Dream pen is, is like something which I am imagining of, which, mm -hmm. which does not exist in reality. But dreamlike pen is like which, which has a substance, which exists actually. Okay, so all of you who said dreamlike pen exists, has substance. If it has substance and if it exists in real, why is it called dreamlike? Conventionally, only conventionally, <laughs> exist conventionally. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mom, mm -hmm. Dream like uh, uh, it, it is made up of parts. Um, that's why uh, uh, all composite things are in common. Okay, very <laughs> nice. Okay, so what Beatrice and Dolkala said, very to very beautiful ways of explaining. So what Beatrice said, why is it called? Okay, so most of the answers we got. Okay, dream pen is something which just comes from your mind, right? It's just your mental creation. It's not really out there. And dream like pen is there. It is there outside of your mind. It, it exists externally, right? This is the difference. But then the next question is, if it exists externally outside of your mind, why do we call it dreamlike? How is it dreamlike? That is the question. So when you ask, why is it called dreamlike according to Madhyamika school? Okay, they do accept externality. Madhyamika school, they do accept externality. But when you ask the question, why dreamlike? Okay, Beatrice said, because it only exists conventionally. It does not exist ultimately. What, is, what does it mean by conventionally and ultimately? Conventionally means just, okay, this pen exists. Okay, I go to any part of the world. I show this pen. Everybody will say this is a pen. Do you all agree? Right? So yes, this, this exists conventionally because this is conventionally accepted by everyone that this is a pen. Okay. And opposite of convention is conventionally is ultimately. So it does not exist ultimately. Ultimately means when you look, okay, when, when you say, you go to a, a stationery shop, you say, this is a pen, the station, okay. You say, I want this pen. The stationery shopkeeper, he will just bring the pen and give it to you. And then I ask him again, I ask the shopkeeper, how does this pen exist? Where is this pen? Okay, so I take the pen and I ask him, where is the pen? Then that's going beyond conventional domain, right? So this is something normally people don't ask such questions, only philosophers, right? Only philosophers or researchers. These days now hard science, we are researching deeper into the nature of the things. So only researchers, philosophers, uh, they ask such questions. When you start asking, even after finding the pen, you ask, where is the pen? Where exactly is the pen? Is the nib the pen? Is the, is the cover the pen? Is the ink the pen? When you start asking questions, when you go beyond the convention, that is, you have already entered the ultimate domain of analysis, right? Uh, you are already in the ultimate analysis. So when you are in the ultimate analysis, you're trying to find this pen. Ultimately, this pen does not exist because you do not find anything. Like Dolkarla said, this is made of parts, right? When you remove the cover, when you remove the nib, when you remove all the parts, when you segregate all the parts, you do not find it, right? The pen just, it's empty of ultimate existence. So this is the ultimate reality. Nothing exists ultimately. So why dreamlike? Because conventionally it's accepted. Conventionally it's there, but ultimately it's not there because it's made of parts. When you remove the parts, the pen disappears, 
right? In the same way, when you're watching a movie on the screen, so what is on the screen? You see the movie, you enjoy the movie. So that experience, you know that the movie is happening, right? Okay, so, and you also sort of, to some degree, you acknowledge and we cry, we get scared watching a horror movie. So this is all convention, we are accepting it, okay? But when you come out of the movie theater, what happens? What happens when you come out of the movie theater? Do you still think what you were seeing on the screen was real? No. No, right? We all know that it was just a movie. Okay. So whatever is on the screen, it's just the conventional truth. Okay. This is, this is something we should remember according to the school. Right? Okay. So movie is basically empty from the screen. Right? The movie is empty from the screen. It exists from the projector. It's coming from the projector. It's coming from the mind subjectively. Okay, just like the rainbow and the mirage. So when you look at the rainbow, you look at the rainbow from a distance and you enjoy the view. You know if there's a rainbow out there. We talk about the rainbow. We all say that, wow, look at the rainbow, beautiful rainbow. You know, we all accept this is conventional truth. But we all know that the rainbow is just coming from our mind. Our, our eyes are perceiving. High consciousness is seeing it as a rainbow. But when you actually go near the rainbow, you do not find the rainbow. We all know that. So this is, uh, okay. This is how it is. Okay, now the truth is, the truth is what we see, according to this all Madhimika philosophy, what we see, is actually coming from the mind. Yet we are unaware of this, the fact that what we see is coming from the mind. We feel that it is out there, something from the object. This is the ignorance. This is deception, according to this school. And now the question is, okay, now the question is, this is a very big question. Uh, how are things coming from the mind? Okay. How are things coming from the mind? We have the conception. Conception of? Okay. Okay, let's take the example of the rainbow, right? Rainbow and... Uh, Okay, let's try to explore this phenomena of the rainbow coming into being. So how is the rainbow coming in? How, okay, we all accept that the rainbow is just our perception. It's not really there. Do you all agree? Or is there anybody who says the rainbow is there? Yes. Okay. How many of you say that the rainbow is coming from your own mind or your own high consciousness perceiving the rainbow as rainbow? How many of you agree to that? Okay, Beatrice, what about the others? Okay, so all your screens are off, so I cannot really... Okay, you can at least raise your hand. Uh, I think there's an option. How many of you agree that the rainbow is just coming from your mind. There's no objectivity. Beatrice, what about others? Yes, others, what do you all think? Let's try to imagine that you're looking at a rainbow. I'm sure we've all had this experience of looking at the rainbow. What do you feel? Is it coming from your mind or is it there, out there? Something called the rainbow. Ma'am, it exists in reality. Aware here at the object level or from the subject? No, no, from the object level. How? How like? Like it appears in the sky. Mm -hmm. 
that's why okay and so we, uh -huh, yes yeah. Uh, yeah, that appears on the sky and we are actually seeing it. Uh -huh. the, that is why. Okay, so if you say it's, it, it exists from the object at the object level. So we have to understand there are two things, right? Subject and object. Either, either a thing can exist from the object or the subject. Okay, this pen. Either this pen can, there are only two ways for this pen to exist. Okay, now this is logic. You, you, you can all try to think. So there are only two ways for this pen to exist. One, one is it, it, it has to exist objectively from its own side. The other is it has to exist from the subject. Right? But then Swatantra Kamadimikas, they say that 50% object, 50% subject. But they still talk about objectivity, right? Okay, so my question to where is Rajdeep? Okay, Rajdeep said this. Okay, now again, my question to Rajdeep, is it from the object or the subject? Ma'am, object. Object, okay. Okay, if it's from the object, I have to find the rainbow when I go closer to the object. Do you agree? No, ma'am. No? Why? Okay, so when you say something exists from the object, you have to accept that if it exists from the object, you have to find something when you go there, closer to the object. Why don't you agree? Uh, what is your... Okay, Rajdeep, uh, let's have an interaction. Okay, so we are trying to understand your position and then... Okay, are you there? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Like, uh, like wherever, like wherever I am, I can see the rainbow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically you are saying the rainbow exists objectively out there. It's not yes, coming yes, from the mind, right? No, so there is an objective existence. So what I'm saying is, if there is an objective existence, if the rainbow exists from its own side out there, not it has nothing to do with the mind, then in that case, when I go closer to the object, which is the rainbow, I have to find the rainbow. Do you agree? Right. Right. Yeah. Right. right. So, okay, now you go closer to the rainbow. Will you find the rainbow? No, ma'am. No, why not? Actually, it is actually rainbow. <coughs> rainbow, rainbow comes from the from dispersion of light from the sky. Mm -hmm. it, it is actually our perception. Exactly. Now you are deferring from your own position, right? So you now you <laughs> now you say. No, no, no. There's no right and wrong. This is just a, this is just an exploration of your own thoughts, how we perceive things, right? So this is right. So okay. So initially, no, it's not just you, Rajdeep. It's all of us. All of us. We always see things to exist objectively, right? To see things to exist subjectively, it's not easy. Like I said, it's like discovering the quantum physics, right? So. We need years and years of rigorous studies to understand quantum physics. Likewise, to understand this concept that things exist from the mind, right? That also is not easy. But then why I took this example of the rainbow? Because rainbow is something, it's a phenomena which all of us accept that we cannot find it when you go closer to it. So it becomes very easy to understand, right? So, okay, so you say rainbow, okay, rainbow is there, we all accept, we all call it a rainbow, why? It's accepted conventionally, so this is a conventional truth. But ultimately, when you go closer to the object, when you go in search of this rainbow, you will not find the rainbow. And then ultimately, when you do not find anything at the object level, you are left with only one option, which is you have to accept that 
it only exists subjectively through your own perception right so that is how even in acharya chandrakirti's text uh, he talks about okay once you discard all possibilities of objective existence the only way the only way to accept the existence of the rainbow is to accept that it only exists subjectively there's no other option left so this is how acharya chandrakirti he uses seven modes of rejecting objective existence in from uh, in madhyamika avatara so basically in mula madhyamika karika which is the root text of madhyamika school by arya nagarjuna arya nagarjuna talked about the five uh, rejections he gave five modes of rejecting objective existence and in madhyamika avatara which is a commentary on this text acharya chandrakirti added two more right and then he gave seven modes of rejecting objective objective existence so after all these seven modes of rejection is done logically then acharya chandrakirti says ultimately now there's no other way whereby this ob- object exists objectively therefore we have to there's no other way but to accept subject subjective existence things coming from the mind so this is how uh, these texts are written based on very strong logic right okay so as long as we understand this and uh, for now it, it's good enough right so whatever you see on the screen in the movie theater whatever you see that's more like the conventional truth like the rainbow we all accept there's a rainbow we talk about it we enjoy the rainbow from a distance so that is conventional truth but ultimate truth is it's empty of objective existence right so that is the ultimate truth okay okay any questions any clarifications you you are about to say how the things coming from the mind okay so how do things come from the mind okay so you, this you... is yeah. yeah so i i'm not giving the exact okay so what i just mentioned how things come from the mind is only by rejecting all degrees of objectivity right once you reject every possibility of objective existence then the only option left for us is to accept subjective existence which is coming from the mind so that's how so for that we have to study madhyamika avatara text or mula madhyamika karika which will take about i don't know many months <laughs> right or even a year so we studied madhyamika avatara text uh, with our teacher at a study retreat 2014 i think uh, we had a study retreat in uttarakhand binsar we were in the mountains a beautiful place uh, a cottage so we were there for 15 days doing this text with our teacher and back then i was like at least for me i was on ground zero i had i did not have any idea about buddhist philosophy yet just listening to it right so so these texts have to be studied very rigorously otherwise so when you finally understand the seven modes of rejection of objective existence then basically acharya chandrakirti says that after you reject the seven modes of objectivity or or objective existence then there's no other way but to accept that things exist subjectively because either sub- something has to something has to exist objectively or subjectively there are only two ways right okay so what i'm trying to say is uh, basically i'm just giving you an overview to really understand how things exist subjectively how things are coming from the mind or okay so we have to really understand we have to really do some rigorous studies this is what i was trying to say okay now going back to the rainbow okay so rajdeep said rainbow how is a rainbow formed most of us know right 
So rainbow is not something solidly there, but rainbow is a phenomenon which comes into being when so many conditions come together. Do you all agree? So we need the light, we need the water droplets hanging in the air, right? There are many conditions. And we also need a certain angle at which the light falls on those droplets. There are many conditions. So when all these conditions come together, then the rainbow appears. So this is what? This is nothing but dependent origination, right? So this Madhyamika school overall, they talk about conventional truth as dependent origination. So this pen comes into being dependently originated. This is dependently originated. Why? Because this depends on the lit, this depends on the nip, this depends on the ink, depends on the cover, right? Also depends on the, what do you call this? Uh, so if, if this last cover it, at the end, if it doesn't have a screw to tighten it, then no matter how much you write, the, uh, the, the refill will keep coming out. So even this, this phenomena of, what do you call this? So, okay, so there's so many things. There's so many things, right? So only when all these conditions come together, something like called the pen comes into being. In the same way, all phenomena, everything, not just phenomena, but your, the self, even us, right? How we come into being is because of so many causes and conditions. And then I, I have been repeating often many times, um, I talked about the four, uh, the four causes, substantial cause, cooperative cause, secondary cause, and unique indispensable cause. So these four causes, if you understand these four causes, which is explained very well in Pramana Vartika chapter two, which is a debate on the mind and body by Acharya Dharmakirti. If we understand all these causes, right? Then we'll understand how things come into being. What is substantial cause? What is cooperative cause? What is unique indispensable cause? What is secondary cause? So all these causes, when they come into being, something comes into existence like the pen, right? So when you understand all these causes and when you remove all the causes, then this thing which we thought exists objectively, it disappears. We find the emptiness of the objective existence. We don't find the emptiness of the pen. Okay, now another important thing. Emptiness of objective existence of the pen and emptiness of the pen. They're two very different things. Okay, so when I say emptiness of the objective existence of the pen, that is the ultimate truth. Right? So emptiness of the pen. Okay, we hear we 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 only hear the term emptiness of this, emptiness of the flower, emptiness of the pen, emptiness of the book, emptiness of the self. So whenever we hear the term emptiness of this, it automatically means objective existence of it. Right? When I say object emptiness of the pen, I find the emptiness of the pen. I do not mean that the pen is pen doesn't exist at all. What I mean is we find the emptiness of the objective existence of the pen, which is the ignorance, right? So there's a stark difference between, if you say we don't find the pen at all, it means you fall into nihilism, non-existence. You're completely rejecting the ex existence of the pen. That becomes nihilism, right? So we are, not, we are not rejecting the existence of the pen. We say that the pen exists. We say that the rainbow exists. We say that the mirage exists, but it does not exist objectively. We are rejecting the objective existence. This is something we need to keep in mind, right? Okay. Okay, so I'll just give the definition for the two truths. So we are doing assertion on the basis. Uh, so basically what I mentioned is under assertion on the basis, assertion of the, on the objects and subjects, there are two, right? The first one, assertion on the objects, we can pick up all those six points from Sautantrika school. 
the two truths and uh, generally and specifically characterized phenomena, right? Hidden and uh, manifest phenomena, the three times, all these six points we can pick up and apply for this school as well as all other schools. These are the objects. And then each of these phenomena, each of the object, they have two truths. This we need to keep in mind. So I have two truths. What is the two truths that I have? Conventional truth and the ultimate truth. All right. So one thing I must share, only the Buddha, right? Only the Buddha can see the two truths of each phenomena simultaneously. Only when one becomes a Buddha, when one attains Buddhahood, we can see the two truths of each phenomena simultaneously at a given moment of time. Only Buddhas can do that. Whereas for all other beings other than the Buddhas, we see the two truths sequentially, not simultaneously. Okay, if I'm in the I've, if I'm meditating on the emptiness of the pen, right? I either, so when I'm in the meditation, I do see the emptiness of the pen. But when I come out of the meditation, I see the conventional truth of the pen. I don't see the ultimate truth of the pen, right? So this we must keep in mind. So there's something called while you are in meditation and post meditative state. After meditation, the perception of the yogis who are outside the meditation and who are inside the meditation, right? So there are things like that, but only Buddhas, only the Buddhas can see the two truths of every phenomena simultaneously. So Buddha can see me as Nilza as a conventional truth, Nilza being existing, depending on the paths, depending on different causes and conditions. This is my conventional truth. Nilza is just a label nothing more than a label. And the ultimate truth of Nilza is I'm empty of objective existence, right? Emptiness of me. So these two truths are seen by the Buddha simultaneously at a given moment of time, right? So this is another important point. Okay, so, Okay, if you'd like to jot down the definition of ultimate truth and conventional truth according to Swatantrika Madhimika. Okay, the definition of ultimate truth. An object. Definition of ultimate truth, an object which is cognized. an object which is cognized by the direct valid cognition an object which is cognized by the direct valid cognition okay direct valid cognition in sanskrit is pratyaksh in tibetan it's called munsum an object which is cognized by the direct valid cognition, cognizing it by the way of cognizing it by the way of dissolving the appearance of duality. Okay, an object which is cognized by the direct valid cognition, cognizing it by, cognizing it by way of dissolving the appearance of duality. An object which is cognized by the direct valid cognition, cognizing it by way of dissolving the appearance of duality. Okay, have you all got the terms? Okay, then we go on to the next definition of conventional truth according to Swatantra Kamadhimika. An object which is cognized by the direct valid cognition, it's the same. An object which is cognized by the direct valid cognition, 
cognizing it with the appearance of duality. It's just the opposite. Conventional truth, an object which is cognized by the direct valid cognition, cognizing it with the appearance of duality. Ma'am, cognizing it by cognizing it with the appearance, with the appearance of duality. Okay. Um, Ma'am, conventional truth, the definition. Okay. An object which is, which is cognized by the direct valid cognition and cognizing it with the with the appearance of duality. Okay. Okay, so an object which is cognized by the direct valid cognition, cognizing it with the appearance of duality. And in terms of the ultimate truth, it says cognizing it by the way of dissolving the appearance of duality. Okay, so let's apply these definitions to the example we gave of, of the rainbow, right? So what is the ultimate truth of the rainbow? What is the ultimate truth? An object which is cognized by the direct valid cognition, which is direct valid cognition, Pratyaksh. Okay, so cognizing it by the way of dis dissolving the appearance of duality. What is duality? Duality is the subject and the object given at, uh, at a given moment, right? So when there's a subject as well as an object, so you dissolve the duality. Do you dissolve the appearance of the duality? So how do you dissolve the appearance of the duality when you realize that the rainbow is empty of object, objective existence or true existence? It doesn't exist truly, right? So there, once you remove the existence of the rainbow existing truly from its own side, right? So then what happens? The duality dissolves. So there's only the subjectivity remaining. There's no objectivity. So there's no, uh, there's no true existence of the rainbow according to the school. So emptiness of the true existence of the rainbow is an example of the ultimate truth according to the school. And definition of conventional truth is an object which is cognized by a valid direct cognition, cognizing it with the appearance of duality. So there's a duality when you are looking at, when you're cognizing the rainbow, there's a duality. So your mind is looking at the rainbow and you're enjoying the rainbow right? You're enjoying the beautiful weather, right? So there's a duality there, cognizing it with the appearance of duality. So there's a duality that appears. Okay, rainbow is there and my mind is also looking at it. So the mind and the object, which is the rainbow, there's a duality. So that is the conventional truth according to this school. So basically the example is the rainbow. If you go by the example of the rainbow, rainbow is the example of the conventional truth. Emptiness of the true existence of rainbow is the ultimate truth. Emptiness of the true existence of the rainbow, according to the school, is the ultimate truth. Okay. All right, so today we'll stop here. And uh, tomorrow, or not tomorrow, sorry, day after, we'll go on to subject, assertion on the subject. And I think we'll have to quickly do this. Okay, so I'm thinking uh, we will take an extra class on Friday. Right, so normally we don't have classes on Friday. 
Fridays. So since this next, this coming Saturday would be the last class for the three month online course. Uh, so Friday we'll have a class, which means we'll have four classes next week, right? Okay. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, these four classes. So I'll try to just quickly finish Madhyamika and then share some very important points uh, from here and there before we end the class. Okay, any, okay, I'm attending this session. Okay. All right, any questions before we disperse? Ma'am, that uh, two truth is according to Shautantrika Madhyamika. Yes, Shautantrika Madhyamika. Shautantrika Shautantrika Madhyamika or Yoga no, no, no. We haven't gone, we are not doing the definitions of two truths according to the two divisions of Shautantrika Madhyamika. Okay. We're not doing that. Yeah, just Shautantrika okay. Madhyamika. So as long as you all remember the, as long as you know the divisions of the different schools, that's good enough. Okay, any questions? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, what is the difference? Um, are you going to explain the definition? Because uh, this definition of ultimate truth and conventional truth, can you apply the same definition for uh, for the Prasangika Madhyamika? No, they have different definitions. Uh -huh. So. Okay, you're going to say next class, okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So we'll finish uh, Swatantraka Madhyamika first. Basically, the only difference is, uh, Beatrice, there's not much difference except the fact that Swatantraka Madhyamika, they accept true existence, uh, they reject true existence, but they accept ob objective existence. So they say that things exist 50% from the subject, 50% from the object. So they do accept some level of objectivity. Whereas Prasangika Madhyamika, they reject all levels of, all degrees of objectivity. They say that it's purely subjective. It's a very subtle Prasangika view. Conve conventional also. Conventional is also... Conventional, not... they... Conventional, okay, let me just check the definition. Okay, so for Prasangika, conventional definition of conventional truth is an object found by a valid cognition which analyzes conventions and with respect to which the valid cognition analyzing the convention becomes a valid cognition analyzing conventions. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> so that is the definition given by the author here. <laughs> it's not mine. Ah, but what? What does it yeah. mean? <laughs> so basically, conventional truth is an object found by a valid cognition, which analyzes the convention, right? And with respect to which the valid cognition analyzing the convention becomes a valid cognition analyzing the conventions. Okay. <laughs> okay, if you want, we speak it next class, don't yeah. worry. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to it in it's the next class. It's not so class. easy, yeah. Okay. It's actually, uh, you can just think of it in terms of dependent origination and think of mm. it in terms of male labeling. Okay. Okay, so Beatrice, your existence, your conventional truth is that you exist as Beatrice, nothing more. Just a label, mere conventional. So mm. beyond that, there's nothing objective about Beatrice. So this is Prasangika not, view. Not even the atoms or the compound not, not space. Nothing. You won't find anything. Not, not, yeah. not even the waves of, of uh, physic, uh, quantum physics. Nothing. No. The yeah. particles. The, 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 nothing, <laughs> yes. So nothing. basically, Prasangika, okay. they reject every degree of objectivity. Whereas Swatantraka Madhyamika, they do accept some degree of objectivity. This is this is the main difference between the two schools. And to understand the real concrete understanding of these 
two schools, the difference between the two schools. We have to study Acharya Bhava Viveka's text and Acharya Chandrakirti's text or Acharya Buddha Palita's text. <laughs> I'm sure there are many things to be discussed upon. Which I'll even let it I'm be not... our next uh, next topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Chanda Kitty. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, I do have the recordings uh, of Geshla's uh, retreat, the teachings on Madhimika Avatara. Uh, okay, if if anyone is very strongly, genuinely interested then I may share, but I have to be first, uh, we need to be, we need to have some general basic foundational understanding of Buddhist philosophy, because these are very intricate texts. Okay. okay. Yes. I will be uh, interested, but um, you just tell me when we are already ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so any questions from the rest of you? Okay, so basically my advice to not just you all, but myself as well, uh, that we in our day-to-day -day lives, we apply this analogy of the rainbow, uh, not just, okay, so we apply how we understand, how we discuss the rainbow, how it exists, right? Coming from the mind and actually not there from the object. We can apply this to everything that we interact with, right? Okay, um, not just everything, but our, even ourselves, how we look at ourselves, how we understand ourselves. We are also like the rainbow, but we don't do that. We look at ourselves as something very solid, right? Permanent. So the, the, the way we, are, we exist is also the way a rainbow exists. It's just from a distance, just mere appearance. When you actually look, go and search of the self, you will not find the self. So we can apply the same analogy to everything around us in our day-to-day -day lives. In fact, uh, my teacher, he, he often in the class, he says that even especially, you know, when you're taking bath, when we take bath, we all feel good, right? We feel, oh, now I'm very clean. <laughs> this, this feeling of, this sense of feeling where you feel that your, your body is so clean now, I'm so fresh. This is also illusion, right? So basically our teacher always says, even when you're taking bath, when you're pouring water on the head, just think that your body is also just dreamlike, like the rainbow, right? So it's not solidly, objectively there. Ma'am, also maybe applied uh, to the uh, dreamlike pain and dream pain. Yes, I mean, if we think uh, a gold pain that is dreamlike pain, if we chase for that, ultimately we 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 can get the only dream pain, mm -hmm. nothing than that. Yeah, it's illusion. It's basically cannot uh, illusion. find anything, yeah. and ultimately we can find the sunnata. Yes. Thank you, Sangamitras. Okay, so if no other questions, then we'll. Uh, stop here and I'll see you all on Monday. Right. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very you. much. Tashidale. Tashidale. Have a nice day. Thank bye you, ma'am. Bye-bye.